Thanks very much. And uh, I have to say, it's an absolute joy to be here. It really is a, a delight, both the quality of the conference that we've had to date, but also the engagement and the learning that has taken place. It's, it's a real privilege. Um, I'd also, I think, like to say on a more general note, our learning from Ireland and Northern Ireland and Canada has gone on for many years. And when we were with the Ministry of Education, we noted the work of Ron Labonte in equity and globalization and all the work that's been done here in terms of education and the school as a, a setting. So we know we've learned from you and uh, we continue to learn from you. But equally, we think today we have something to share with you because that's also what it's all about. Before I say anything else, I'd like to also genuinely um, give a note of appreciation for the extraordinary experience that it has been working with Mary Gordon and her team in terms of the roots of empathy exposure. I mean, honestly, the individuals that have come to a different culture that is Northern Ireland, uh, and I'm thinking of Cherie Fogarty and Cathy Alvis in particular, but also the mentoring backup and the individual people who came to work with us on our journey has been brilliant. And I do remember when Mary first came to Northern Ireland and we were all huddled into a wee tiny room and we got principals from uh, a part of Belfast working in very disadvantaged areas. And of course, it was just instant. It was just this bond immediately. And I felt it myself when I met Mary for the first time. So it's a heartfelt acknowledgement of not only that um, interpersonal and uh, profound expertise, but also the experience that her staff and her team have brought to this, and we deeply appreciate it. So what I'm going to do is, uh, is speak for a little bit about the context of what we've been doing in Northern Ireland at a, a strategic level, and um, what we're trying to do within a broader framework in terms of public health. And then Morris is going to talk about a number of specific examples to get into a bit of detail about what we're doing in building an early years community. And then we'll finish with a little bit of learning and, and reflection. So uh, that's what we're going to do. I mean, I think the key thing really has been that we've approached this quite systematically. Because one of the things that we are aware of if, is that there have been a whole range of programmes over the years and projects, typically short term funded. And what we wanted to try and do was move away from that and build something that was much more sustainable and much more um, impactful over time. So uh, that's what we're going to do. And uh, the first thing, I, that's really the outline of the presentation. Um, this first little picture is very important because it's the part of the world that I'm from, which is called Cushendun, and it's uh, one of nine glens of the glens of Antrim in County Antrim. And right across, 16 miles across the sea, is Scotland. And in fact, in days gone by, the confluence was between the north of Ireland and Scotland. So I know people's heritage here, and so we regard ourselves as honorary Scots people at times. Um, but I suppose, my own background is around health inequalities and the publication of the Black Report, No Relation, in 1979, and the absolute um, recognition of the need for social justice around patterns of inequalities. This other beautiful photograph is where Morris hails from, Strangford Loch, a neighbouring county, County Down. Not as nice as County Antrim, you understand. <laughs> but, um, but you may know about uh, Van Morrison, some of his wonderful songs, and Coney Island is in that sort of neighborhood. So it's a beautiful part of the country. Um, but it has also experienced profound um, uh, exposure as a result of our conflict. So we are a country of contrasts, and this legacy of the conflict is what we are still living with. So those are some of the statistics, and we are now almost 20 years from the Good Friday Agreement. But there isn't a day, honestly, in Northern Ireland when we are not aware of the impact and, and the, the force of that legacy of the conflict. Suffice it to say that it is the ongoing paramilitary activity, sectarianism, that challenge all of us every day. But at the same time, this is a very hopeful story. And we do think that in Northern Ireland, we have something that we have been through, that we are building on, that we can share with others. 
And um, this is just to give you an idea of what children have been exposed to. In one sense, it was an abnormal exposure and people normalized it because that was how you managed to survive. And yesterday, Michael talked about vicarious resilience and I think that's a very good example of it in many ways. But we're coming out of violence. We're well on that road. And despite some of the stalls we've had with our recent um, political hiatus, there is absolutely no doubt we're on that trajectory. And we have moved hearts and minds, as Senator George Mitchell said, in on the streets of Belfast. Um, and this symbol, if you like, is the Peace Bridge in Derry, stroke London Derry, that would you believe it, people couldn't have believed it, became city of culture for the United Kingdom. Uh, and as they coined the phrase, legendary. I loved it because the term London Derry or Derry is actually a divisive title. So they created a new one. We're good at doing that. Um, and then another image is really from the Hound. For those of you who are interested in the Game of Thrones, I'm afraid I know nothing about it, but it is simply a little bit of a reflection of our creativity beginning to re-emerge. So who are we in terms of a population? We're small, 1.8 million, 85 million, and we're within the United Kingdom. Um, and you can see where we are logistically there in terms of United Kingdom and Europe. We're also a place of change in terms of the population. Our population is aging. And we're moving much more toward a wall as opposed to a pyramid with older people at the, at, at the, at the pinnacle. And that's common in other parts of Europe at the minute. But because of our diversity, or rather, I beg your pardon, because of our conflict, we've also had a very stable population. We've not had the new incomer populations, and that's just beginning to change, which is bringing a whole new uh, wonderful diversity um, to our uh, communities. But as you can see, it's still a very small percentage of our population. Uh, and we have also had our share of the Syrian refugees that someone mentioned earlier. And just this morning, I had an email from one of those people as a thank you uh, for some of the work that's going on uh, in terms of their reintegration re into our community. But it is a place of contrast because the OECD in 2015 have identified that our 15-year-olds regard themselves as the happiest in the United Kingdom. Right? And that's great. But on the other hand, we also have the highest rate of suicide in the United Kingdom. It's three times the level in some areas of Northern Ireland. So we've got a real problem in terms of mental health and well-being. And it would be an oversimplification to say it's as a result of the conflict. It really would. But we know that that has added another dimension to what we are dealing with and to the emergence out of conflict and that more normalizing um, of our society. The biggest thing, um, and that gives you a little bit of a comparison in terms of how we are with the other countries in the United Kingdom, and as you can see, we, we, we are not able at the minute to create a downward trajectory. One has argued we're doing well to hold it steady, um, but that feels very poor, I can tell you, when you're looking into the face of those figures uh, all the time. Uh, the other uh, contrast, I guess, is we have very profound patterns of inequalities in health that I mentioned at the outset. So you can see there that in the most deprived and the least deprived communities, there's a huge difference. And what we know from all the work that Professor Sir Michael Marmot has done for the World Health Organization in terms of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health and the translation of that into the United Kingdom and a, a policy for the United Kingdom, we know that the patterns are consistent and persistent over time. We know that people are living longer and they're having a better quality of life. But unfortunately, those that are least advantaged are not moving ahead at the same pace as those that are more advantaged so that the gap remains persistently high. And that is a real challenge for all of us, and we can't do it in health alone, and we can't do it in education alone. It requires this joined up approach. So that is a little bit about the pattern of inequalities in health. Um, the other uh, thing I wanted to just touch on, again, we see this pattern in terms of poverty, access to school meals, which are free for, for low-income families, and um, 
other patterns, really, in terms of teenage pregnancy. You'll still see that same pattern. You see the same pa pattern in terms of educational performance as well. So it's a real challenge for all of us. Uh, now, I mentioned the other load, which was the impact of the conflict. And we have a lot of work that's been done on the work uh, of victims and survivors of the conflict. But one of the things we do know is the impact that it has had on children and young people. And it has been quite profound. And if you just have a look at that um, figure there, approximately 15% of the population who experienced conflict-related activity went on to develop mental health difficulties. And that was estimated to be about 213,000 individuals out of a population of 1.85 million, remember. So it's very significant. And in terms of children, we know that that has had impacts in terms of parenting and um, the intergenerational conflict that that uh, gives rise to and the impact on children and young people. We also know from Alan Shore that that important early relational experience is pivotal in terms of an adult's mental health trajectory. And I know Morris will say a lot more about that. So on top of the load of inequalities and poverty and disadvantage, we also have the legacy of the conflict. So it's really just to paint a picture of what we're actually dealing with. So the second bit I'd like to talk about is the strategic context for the work we're doing. And we have now developed um, a new programme for government, which is focused around outcomes. What are the outcomes we want for the population and for children and young people? And our government have identified 14 outcomes. Now, this is really very important for us because what it is saying is, irrespective of which government department and which policy you happen to be championing, you are all working toward 14 outcomes. They've consulted on these 14 outcomes. We now have a stall in our political process, but everybody has agreed that this is the only game in town. This is the game changer in terms of forcing organizations, agencies, policies, and departments to actually pull together around a common agenda, including in particular health and well-being, prosperity, security, and equality. And particularly, education and health for the first time are working to support and promote positive emotional health and well-being of children and young people. So it's a very profound shift for us because it is saying it doesn't matter which department you're coming from, this is the goal. Um, so very briefly then, in terms of understanding why we need that coordinated approach, just to touch on the background to this, you would be familiar with this. In terms of health, 40% of the factors that affect health and well-being lie outside of the health and social care and community system. So that points you toward doing a much more integrated ecological approach. And I mentioned the work of Professor Sir Michael Marmot in the WHO Determinants on Social Health in Northern Ireland, we distilled that down to a public health framework called Making Life Better. And Making Life Better is very much about improving the universal services that Marmot has highlighted as being so fundamental. But within universalism, targeting then those that are at greater need. And you need to do both. Um, and the vision and aims are translated into six themes. And we've been working across all six of these themes uh, that will then, as I say, be reinforced through the programme for government. One of the things that is really important about this is that it is about addressing the conditions and determinants of health. Because if we only tamp around the edges with programmes, we may see changes, but they won't be sustainable over time. And so it is very important for us to work not only with health and education, but with those in government responsible for social development, physical activity, and so forth. Yesterday, Michael talked about the challenge of the environment to support children to build resilience. So one of the things that has been fundamental in our work programme is to engage with communities, community development. And in particular, to build on the strengths and skills of local communities, rather than, as you know, you know, uh, jettison in or, or, or in, insert programs. It has to be an engagement, a real process. 
So working along those themes, and in particular working with communities, has been very important. And one of our programmes is about promoting mental health and wellbeing and the New Economics Foundation Take Five. And you'll recognise the links there to the development of empathy you can't, you know, and to social engagement. So the evidence is strong for this. And we've used Take Five simply because in, in, in our part of the world, Take Five applies to take five pieces of fresh fruit and vegetables for your physical well-being. This is Take Five for your mental well-being. And we're finding that it's, it's gaining traction. It also requires to be backed up at local community in terms of promoting good mental health and well-being in schools and settings. And of course, a critical part of that is the Roots of Empathy programme. We've also worked with faith-based organisations, and this programme on Flourish is working with churches. And it's not only about what do you do when something goes wrong, but it's also about the self-care of those who are in churches uh, and looking after their health and well-being. And again, at a local level, things like engaging people in, in physical activity, uh, uh, green environment, um, uh, horticulture, and so on, they may seem a bit of a stretch for you from mental health and well-being, but believe me, this is how you build mental health and well-being, and our evidence is backing that up. One other area that's been very important to us is to engage with the arts programmes. So a few examples in, in terms of uh, programmes that we've run. This one is working with looked after children and uh, the profound impact that sculpture, poetry, um, painting, digital art, performance art has had for those children is really quite remarkable and has brought many a tear to our eyes, Morris and I, when we go to the celebration at the, at the end of the year. Um, physically, within towns, this is Derry again. And all of that is building a, a community, we believe, of health and well-being. Now, I wanted to just touch on the outcomes-based accountability and mention the 14 outcomes that government are going for. But I wanted to just say a little bit more about where that comes from. So that is based on the work of Mark Friedman, who many of you may know. I'm not sure how commonly applied it is in Canada. But basically, it is about looking at uh, action that is required at a population level, as well as at a performance level in terms of programs, and taking a very systematic approach to, if that's the outcome I want, what is the data? What evidence do I have for that data? How am I going to measure the impact? And what difference will it make? Which is the fundamental question. Most importantly, it can be used at a population level as well as at a program level. And it forces different kinds of conversations with different organizations because I can't achieve my outcome unless I work with all these different people and they've got to agree and create that mechanism for, for growth and development. So the, the outcome of, and the most important question of all, is, is anybody better off? So this is the kind of typical scorecard you aim to get toward at the end. So how much did we do? Um, how well did we do it? And is anybody better off? And I can tell you it's a huge challenge to actually get it to that. But that's a journey we're on in terms of outcomes. I wanted to just then move to the early years agenda and just preface what um, Morris is going to say by way of example with how we got there. So there were a number of policy advisors and one of the people that came to Northern Ireland in the very early days was Graham Allen, Harry Burns, the former Chief Medical Officer of Scotland, and um, David Owles, no, he came, but the one before that, Hoskins, yeah. So these people were really helpful to us because they helped us think through how would you build a policy that would support early years development? And one of the things that Graham Allen, who by the way is just about to retire with the, with the change of government, really pointed toward was the investment and the, the benefit to the economy, to everybody if we invested in early years. And he drew our attention to Heckman's, a Nobel Prize winner, and the investment profile of that. He also later identified 23 billion, 23 billion, as the estimate in the United Kingdom that is spent on perinatal mental health and child maltreatment. 
if we didn't intervene. That was the projected spend, almost two thirds of the defence spend. So, you know, it's huge in terms of implications for society. And what all of that work did was to point us very clearly toward a number of interventions. And one of the things we did in those early days was establish a child development programme board chaired by the Director of Public Health, but working across all of those organisations and agencies that I've mentioned. So different sectors, um, community, voluntary, statutory, academic, and, and parents themselves actually, uh, coming together and really thinking through what programmes are we going to grow how are we sure that the evidence is going to stack up and how will it translate to a situation like Northern Ireland and how will we be sure we'll improve outcomes? So we've been on this journey for the last um, seven years and six years uh, for the programme board um, that I've mentioned and it has really forced this interdisciplinary uh, working across boundaries. You'll recognise some of those programmes but what we're aiming to do is build them to a scale over time, local programs that are well evidenced, well researched, as well as some of these big international programs. Uh, and of course, that's where Roots of Empathy um, fits in. Um, the way I'd like to just present that, I suppose, is what we regard as our model. So that if you start with infant mental health and the need to nurture that early brain that we just talked about, and then you move towards some of that early parenting support, and you then continue to look at when things go wrong, getting good child support and intervention, as well as good, strong universal services. And you finally then, in schools, build the potential for social and emotional learning through roots of empathy. And as Mary has said, or, or, sorry, as we mentioned, we're still learning how best to implement that. So that is our model and that is our approach and it sounds as if it's very logical and very um, straightforward. It's been anything but. It's been very hard work, but we are sticking at it um, uh, and, um, uh, and we have a great deal further to go yet. So I'm going to pass now to Morris. He's going to go into five of those programmes with a bit more detail to give you a better understanding of what it looks like in practice. Well done, Mary. Um, okay, so I'm so excited. Uh, Mary Ito's reaction yesterday to Dan Siegel, I mean, I just found she was so electrified, wasn't she? And I kind of, I feel that in terms of my relationship with Mary Gordon, you know, over the past seven years. I mean, she's just, you know, I just feel as if I've been animated and kind of made the subject of really personal attention and interest in terms of my potential as a leader to affect change in terms of this outcomes for children agenda. So it's been really exciting, but I suppose my complaint is I feel a bit like um, Jack Nicholson in terms of uh, as good as it gets. You know, I can't, I can't get my own life back. <laughs> you know, she, she, she's evicted me from my life, you know. So, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the WB Yates talks about that. Um, uh, you know, at, at, whenever green is worn, you know, a terrible beauty is born. So it is disruptive, you know. Uh, and I think that's partly a kind of, um, when you're in proximity to Alan Shore and Bruce Perry and Andrew Meltsoff and all of these research learnings or whatever, you know, they really do, when you connect that to people like Mary and I who get angry at health inequalities and want to do something and are persistent in our kind of, uh, you know, seek for solutions, do you know what I mean? Uh, and then combined with our context, it makes things happen. So, so thank you very much for, for all of that. Mary and I brought um, a salmon over as a gift to Mary, you know, so, um, and, and, and the salmon is quite an important symbol in Irish, Irish mythology, and there's a kind of uh, salmon of knowledge, you know, there's a whole backstory of Finn McCool and how he essentially became the giant that he became, not because of size, but because he ate the, sa the salmon of knowledge. So, so I think, eat the salmon of knowledge, and Mary's doing that. I think, you know, she is changing the world, not just child by child, but person by person. So good luck in your journey, and I hope I'm going to then reflect a few stories, glide through a very small sample of a number of small things, of things that, well, not small, quite big things for us, but hopefully they might connect to some of the things that you're doing, and hopefully there's some learning that we can share in terms of what that connects to your journey. So Roots of Empathy, um, uh, that's 
That's one of our big signature programs. This is one of the things that we started with, and we brought that to scale. One in seven primary school children in Northern Ireland receive the Roots of Empathy program. We are so delighted. We're so excited. Our relationship and our partnership with your team, Mary, has just been, it's been co-production in its genuine, most genuine sense. It's been a pleasure how we've built the implementation circumstances and the attention to how your team has supported us, not just stack up a number of programs, but to be very careful about how we've built the implementation circumstances so that uh, so we can be very confident that what is there is so solid and implemented so well to dosage and fidelity. Uh, it's been fantastic. And um, it was a reference to the Queen's research that took place over the RCT over four years for 67 to schools who were uh, at the very start of that journey who were tracked through. So exciting results in terms of the increase in pro-social behaviour, decrease in difficult behaviour, and we're looking forward to the final launch of that research so we can have a big conversation with Roots of Empathy and Queen's, our Department of Education, our Education Authority, and others about what we've got here and how we can align that, align that to a meta-analysis that we're doing on social emotional learning with primary school children, which will come, is coming through on July, which is a worldwide review of what works in primary school support and social emotional learning. And also to take, uh, take account of other interventions, and Brenda was talking uh, earlier about, uh, to us about in Hawaii, uh, about some of the range of interventions, including Roots of Empathy, that really are, represent an exciting portfolio of work supporting this key agenda. So, so this is, that's, one of our, that's one of my five little vignettes in terms of, of, of one of the things that we've done. Again, and I think I did mention one in seven primary school. And I think contextually fitting into an environment coming out of the troubles where we have a fundamental long history of suspicion of the other, whatever the other is. Uh, and we are seeing that, you know, manifesting in very unpleasant ways in terms of uh, some of the um, responses to the newcomer communities uh, and so on. So um, uh, we've got a lot to do around this uh, respect for equality and diversity and, and respect for the other uh, agenda. So Roots of Empathy helps us do that. Um, okay, so one of our other applied interests is really coming from the research and the old ACEs agenda, the adverse childhood episodes we talked, it was referenced a lot yesterday. And actually now in public health terms, we have a really big, big senior conversation taking place, particularly between Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland about what we're gonna do about this critical agenda around ACEs. And it was really confirmed, Dan, Michael yesterday, all the speakers and Lise today, you know, it really does confirm we got to get this start of life stuff right. And when you have some significant kind of um, impacts that are going to uh, affect multitudes of adverse childhood episodes that are going to accumulate, we know this is going to have strong manifestations in terms of later life uh, potential disease profile. And you can see there really how that scales up. This can really, really, you know, get into the biology and it can really affect uh, the profile. And I know for me on a personal level, you know, that, that has significance in terms of my own background, you know, TIA at 44. So I know, I know, I know, kind of know this stuff. So, but again, you know, I do believe in the wounded healer, you know, what we can do, what we know we can do more about. So I'm certainly passionate about how we then bring this forward. And just that gives give some reflection of, uh, of, of some of the implications. This is coming out of the Welsh study, and I would really encourage you to look up uh, Mark Bielis and the uh, Welsh study. Really interesting, profound results there in terms of what we're seeing about um, uh, the implications for uh, behaviours. And you can, see, you can see there in terms of the astounding um, uh, implication in terms of the increase in risk factors. And these variables are actually independent of poverty, so uh, it really makes it all the more astounding, the kind of effect of accumulation of multitude of adverse childhood episodes in, in children and, that, and the implication that can have for them and in later life. So what are we going to do about it? Well, again, that's fur further, further implications in terms of some of the factors um, and what could be potentially reduced. Mary was talking about the cost saving. Uh, th this Welsh um, is... The Welsh ES study, which is just out, really includes a projection of what the potential ex reduction uh, in, 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 in some, a number of, of, of headings could mean, and the cost-saving implication of that, if we can get that right. 
And this really reflects a kind of slide which indicates, well, what can we do around the prevention of ACES agenda uh, for her nurse family home? nurse home visiting, parenting programs, preschool enrichment, screening for parents. And these are obviously the basis upon which we then are saying, okay, well, what have we got in terms of our prevention capacity and what do we need to put in place? So I wanted to kind of just make a reference to a new project. And kind of, again, this is about the, the solution space. We have moved now to find a intervention here for Northern Ireland over the next four years. So essentially we are developing a MACE project on a cross-border basis, we're going to target 3,000 families. Uh, and the things that we're going to do with our purposefully intended, kind of carefully uh, developed application for which we have then, I think around about seven and a half million Canadian dollars uh, for the next four years to kind of do something with this project. So essentially what we're going to do is firstly establish an adversity matrix and risk stratification tool to allow the early identification of vulnerable families. And there will be families with not to threes and families with 11 to 13 year olds. We're then going to develop a range of interventions to those assessed using the adversity matrix and or the risk stratification tool. And along the way, we're going to really educate all the professionals who engage with families about the, about the uh, adversity matrix and get people to be comfortable about what it is that they might need to do as professionals in terms of the engagement with families to assess risk and maybe to use the tools. And then we're going to use the bulk of the money to um, support 3,000 families over three years, over four years, who are identified uh, through the application of the matrix. So we'll certainly keep in contact with you, any of you want to keep in contact with us about how this project rolls out, because if we get this piece right, we could possibly scale that to apply it across all of our families across Northern Ireland, and potentially the Republic of Ireland as well. So very exciting, and that's the kind of cross-border focus of the geographies that we're going for in terms of this, this MACE study. So again, it's moving all of that kind of policy and research into an intervention. So incredible years, well, this is one of the uh, one of our big, another of our signature programs, uh, and essentially, uh, kind of, I'm going to kind of whiz through the slides on this, but essentially, we're very convinced by it. We really do feel that as an evidence-based program, there's a, there's a series of products, really right, which fit into school settings, into community settings, and early year settings. We really do feel it's a highly flexible uh, uh, and very interesting kind of portfolio of programs which have prevention and treatment uh, effects for, for children. Um, and, the, and essentially that's what the, the full suite of programs looks like. Um, and we've been kind of essentially trying to think, oh, what balance of what programs do we have in place that can engage our school systems, that can engage our community systems and our early year systems. But one of the things that we, uh, and essentially that's, the, 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 we just think these are the outcomes that we're seeking to achieve with, with this incredible years program. I did look it up and it is running in Toronto, uh, but it seems to be primarily public health nursing uh, run, running the programs. Um, but definitely I think for us, one of the big challenges is actually how we can get consensus across education and health about how it is that we can have full, I suppose, uh, purchase uh, and, and capacity for rollout of the programme across school systems and community settings. And, and here's a learning for, for I want to share with you, because we thought when we found the programme to say, okay, this is the answer, like, you know, so what are we going to do? Get a cape, wear a cape, fly. And, and, and that's the learning for us over five, six, seven, seven years, is it's actually the implementation circumstances of this programme that has really been the biggest challenges for us. The front end purchasing of programs is really easy. Making sure they're implemented and implemented with fidelity and dosage is the biggest challenge. That's one of the things that I've spent a lot of my brain power um, and the brain power of others working out how it is that we could really work out not just front end training, but full implementation uh, and, and scaling. And essentially, some of the work of Alan's and Metz around some of the implementation science has been helpful in, in that regard. And essentially, that's where we're kind of thinking about the, the implementation fit and the fit for the program. And what works, how it works, people and structures and benefits for children, rather than just assuming that we've got the program, it's tested and tried elsewhere internationally, let's just you know, get them running. Um, and get hundreds of them running in the program. So we, we've built a what's called an Incredible Years Coordination Program uh, where we are focused on strategic 
coordination, establishment of a learning community, and standardized monitoring and evaluation systems. And essentially, the middle circle is really about making sure that we have a full culture of fidelity and quality implementation and to ensure the, the outcomes for children and young people. So it's, uh, we're very pleased about the project and how it's rolled out. And essentially, it shows here the headings around training and supervision that we've really put in place. And the reason we put in place is that, and it's a bit embarrassing, but there you go, we'll, we'll be honest with you. What we did when we reviewed the thousand or so um, uh, leaders that had been trained in Northern Ireland. Part of the project was that what we did was let's find out how many of them are running programs and how many accredited group leaders we have, how many accredited peer coaches, how many accredited mentors. And you can see on the right hand of this, we were, it was barren. So we realized out of that that actually what we were doing was front end purchasing training for um, people to do the training for the program. And then only 10% of those who were ever trained were actually running the program. And of, even of those, very few of them were receiving a group leader, moving on to become group leaders, peer coaches, or accredited mentors. So we've really then really readjusted and focused then on, on that. And here's the results of the focus that we've had. Now we do feel as if we're really improving the implementation circumstances. And this, here's our previous minister. At, at the Incredible Years uh, coordination program. So it really shows you the importance of actually bringing this kind of stuff to a higher political level and making sure that with Carol and St Stratton White, um, who is the North American leader of the program, uh, how, how that, that's a priority for the highest levels of government. Infant mental health, really important. I think in some ways we're ahead of the game in policy terms for Northern Ireland about putting in place an infant mental health framework in Northern Ireland. But based on Bruce Perry, Andrew Meltzoff, Dan Siegel, and many of the others, how could we not? In some ways then we've been influenced to say, let's get it in place. It may not be the right time, there may not be a full policy buy-in, but it's the right thing to do. And we're very convinced that it is the right thing to do. And that the science would suggest that we, it is the right thing to do. Just, if you wanna kind of take that in, he's the um, uh, kind of uh, center for, it's, a, it's a Center for Development Child at Harvard, uh, professor. I mean, so you're talking about a kind of lead expert. And the statement then he's saying is that we can make a difference here. So we have interventions that enhance the mental health, executive function skills, and self-regulation capacities of vulnerable mothers suggest promising strategies to protect the development brains of their children. So if that's what we're saying can be done, let's do, let's do it. Again, I think this comes from Alan Shore, a uh, kind of reference he made. And I think it's just an incredible statement. The enduring impact of early maternal care during critical pains in early brain development in health and disease is likely to be one of the most important discoveries in all of science. I mean, for me, that just sends electric through me. <laughs> and when I began to read that stuff, I was going, whoa, we're in, we're in, we're in the right place uh, in terms of what we need to do here. So our framework for infant mental health is to ensure that all children have the best start in life by prioritizing and supporting the development of positive social and emotional mental well, emotional well-being. I'm going to just glide over the headings, but essentially here's our framework. We're going to do stuff on evidence and policy because we think that the sheer evidence and policy and practice and research can have powerful effects in terms of mobilizing. It's a bit like Mary Gordon animating, getting people electrified, animating them. You know, so we're going to try and bring this to all parts of government. And we know already that we've had you know, results in terms of parts of government then saying, okay, well, if that's the case, we'll increase our 25% increase investment on childcare for neighborhood renewal areas, the most disadvantaged areas in Northern Ireland. And that's just simply by virtue of bringing the evidence and research to them. Workforce development, we had a little of exchange with Dan about this yesterday, but we've absolutely got to get the right skills for our professionals right across our professions to support this intervention with, with, with not to threes. And we know the challenges there. We know that our child and adolescent mental health services are largely only engaging with people at, from children from eight onwards. But if the damage is being done much earlier, then you're likely to be working with 14-year-old self-harming teenagers forever unless you're going to then say, we've got the capacity to re-engage where damage may be accruing in families where children were not to three. 
And finally, we've got to make sure the service development piece then flows from the workforce development. So essentially, we've got to realign and do much better, have much better front-end prenatal and mental health services, child psychotherapists, psychologists, health visitors working together as multidisciplinary teams, referrals that we're getting for into the, from, the, from, from the field into these teams which really have the capacity and the expertise to kind of work therapeutically and strongly with, with families who need it. And, that, that, and that's our triangle about how it is that we're going to support that. Just to move on then to another vignette which is essentially the government piece. And this is a early intervention transformation program. Uh, and essentially this shows how at a government level, working with Atlantic Philanthropy, we have a big investment in trying to test how we might innovate and to create better universal services, create better pathways for families with emerging vulnerability, and then to be able to have the right models in place for families who are in, already in the system, uh, what we call tier three families. Um, so, so that's our model. It's an exciting, it's called the Early Intervention Transformation Program. It's a subject of, I suppose, about 50 million Canadian dollars um, to support interventions in this space with a view to saying, okay, if we get some of these things right in terms of getting a, a better design for our universal services, um, how can we then, uh, then scale them and make those changes? Oh, I suppose maybe just, uh, yeah, just to go back to that, just maybe for Ruth's um, benefit, one of the things that we're doing, particularly in terms of the universal services, is joint assessment. We, we discussed this with you during our visit, but the, the joint assessment between health professionals and um, nursery school staff around children at, uh, at, at, at age three before they arrive into primary school, we think is a game changer because it creates a whole new conversation of, uh, across professional groups in terms of families to work out whether there may be significant developmental delays which need intervention before the children then arrive into school and begin to fail and struggle. So that's one of the interesting things. But the piece I have responsibility for is what's called the tier two piece, the early intervention support service. And essentially what we're doing there is we've designed what the evidence suggested could be the best thing to work with families with emerging vulnerabilities to stop families before they then move into deeper end systems. Uh, and that essentially is a combination of family support s service staff, fam family, s family workers, family group conferencing, which I'm not sure you might be familiar with, but drawn from the Maori tradition um, in New Zealand, uh, where essentially you have a way of engaging with complex problems within families, not just by trying to keep banging at the single parent that you have in a room, but to bring in a wider set of people who might be part of the solutions that might be helpful in terms of um, enabling the overcoming of problems. So it's a, it's a model that, we're, we're, that, we're, that we've built into this early intervention service. And then finally, a kind of combination so that families then may be able to access a number of, of parenting programs. So just to draw things together, a couple of reflections, firstly in terms of learning uh, and then our future development. So in terms of learning, I mean, you know, the amount of work that is required across organisations across organisations is only possible if you really build partnerships. So that is a fundamental finding. These are complex, wicked problems, as we all know. You've got to really build the partnerships. The other thing is that uh, implementation, as Mara says, it needs more than capes. You really need to plan for it and uh, give a lot of attention to it. So that um, requires us, I think, to be very systematic in what we're doing. The other thing we really invested in is research. We're taking this stuff seriously. We're interrogating. And, uh, and, and sometimes that's hard because you're not always getting the answers that you want. But we are doing quite a lot of research, both on established programs and, and homegrown programs to evaluate them. The meta-analysis, Morris referred to, but we're also doing a Cochrane review about intensive home visiting and what is the best practice. The other important thing about research, oh sorry, I pressed the wrong one, is uh, working with education in different disciplines in terms of the academic input. These are websites um, that you can uh, go to in terms of nurture groups and some work that Professor Connolly and his team are doing and have evaluated from an effective and a cost-effective perspective. And looking at how does that link 
well-being study in schools looking at a range of measures over time and that WISE study is part of a UK-wide study. So we learn from that again over time. And of course, the randomized controlled trial of rates of empathy. Um, so the one thing that I'd like to sort of um, mention is that all of that high level stuff is very important. But if it doesn't translate down to places to where people live and to make sense and coordinate it at a local level, it actually can be quite diluted so that if the school doesn't join with the, with the health and social care system, with the community and voluntary system at a local level and across programs, it, it, its impact is, is severely um, affected. So this is one of the things we've been looking at, um, translating at a place-based um, approach how we make good that commitment across government to the local. And, oh, sorry, we're going the wrong way. Uh, and one of the things is to tie that in, not only to the programme for government and making life better, but also local community planning. And that will create the context for a healthy place over time. In terms of our future development then, I think um, what we really need to do is to keep the learning and keep the focus on being critical uh, about what it is we're doing continue to be systematic in our approach and to share and to be prepared to open up and be critical about some of those findings. I think the other paradox that we have to deal with is, and this is true for all of us, is that the funding for programmes like this are sometimes short term, but the goal is long term. Our politicians are short term, but the impact that we need to have is long term. So that's why my hope for the programme for government is so important, because it's a 10-year framework. That's the longest one we've had for quite a while. So it is that paradox. We know we're not going to get a magic fund. Uh, uh, there is no, it's going to go the other way in terms of austerity. So it's about how we make better use of the resources we've got. And the only way you can do that is by joining up and aligning and building alliances. So for me, that's really very important. And one of the things we will do, I believe, is build a community and change the environment so that it becomes more supportive, that it will reinforce, as Michael said, uh, uh, the environment that sponsors resilience and build across those boundaries um, so that over time we will build a community that supports that early brain development and early years and family support and engagement. So I leave you with the words of one much greater than my own um, from our favourite poet, Seamus Heaney. And this isn't one of his poems, it's a reflection that he made. And for me, it's incredibly important because it is about the grind at times of also being prepared to stop, reflect, start again. And I think it's just really important, getting started, keeping going, getting started again in art and in life. It seems to me, this is the essential rhythm not only of achievement, but of survival. The guarantee of credibility in our lives, credibility to yourselves as well as to others. Thanks very much. Uh, questions? Yes, Joshua. I guess I'd like to hear more detail about the kind of how you train a, t a parent to be a better parent. Um, okay. And that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, some of the things that we've been doing um, is that we've uh, come across a thing called video inter interactive guidance. I don't know if you know that. But essentially, um, these are new evidence-based, um, new interventions that involve professionals going into a family with a mobile device. And essentially, rather than a family having to go to a big family centre and big cameras being set up to film interact their interaction with the child. The professional is engaging with the family in the home. And that essentially is a strength-based approach. So the family where there may be attachment difficulties, there may be relationship issues, there, may be, there, there are issues. And often some of the mums may be having children taken into care or risk of children being taken into care. So what will happen is the professional using a strength-based approach will get alongside that parent and begin to say, okay, let's do some filming about you, how you're interacting with your child 
and again on a strength-based approach, be able to show back to the parent the filming about how the parent is interacting with the child. And over time, and with a bit of confidence and a good, good relationship, the, the parent begins to see, actually, rather than do what, we, what I know as a social worker, we all sometimes do, we tell these parents, you stop, you know, you can't do that. Um, uh, you know, you gotta get the, 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 fam, the person to understand and seeing back where there's joy in, a, in the infant's face when the parent is interacting the lights start to go on. And actually, there have been a number of examples of, of families where children have been returned to parents, <laughs> you know, as a result of not just that intervention alone, but as an example of the kind of interventions we're looking at to support better attachment and relationship. We also know that the single biggest influence of that kind of, is the quality of the relationship between the, the worker and the, you know, so there's something about the integrity of that relationship that really matters in that situation. Um, I've just noticed that there's been a lot of talk the last two days about the ACEs, the Adverse Childhood Experiences, which is really nice to hear it coming mainstream. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about therapies that you found successful, because my understanding is that a lot of these experiences happen when children are pre-verbal, so the trauma is locked in their body, I guess often that is, and talk therapy isn't particularly successful. So I'm wondering if you're offering therapies for people who experience tra trauma. Yeah, we're, we're, we're at a really early stage about actually being able to learn what it is to go in with a set of professionals with a ACE questionnaire, um, both for, 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 the ch for children, young people, um, it's, we're in the early stages. There's a little bit of a pilot that's been done in one of our trust areas. We're finding that the professionals are reporting back that actually it is, it is as we were expecting it to be. It's resulting in more complex circumstances be emerging in terms of what's known in terms of the child's life and the parent's life. And actually there's often probably going to be a need for more intervention rather than, uh, than, 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 than than was the case before the questionnaire. Because if you ask these questions, you're going to realize you're going to come across stuff. So we're at an early stage of then working out from our mainstream services who are piloting what the implication is of whether they need more of existing services or something different. Uh, we'll learn a lot more about the MACE project in terms of how it is that we are engaging with professionals to equip them to do the ACE questionnaires and what the implication is for the right interventions. I think your, your question uh, is, 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 a, is a profound and challenging one, and frankly, I don't know. Um, uh, it would, I'd certainly bring that question to Wales, to Cardiff, next Thursday and Friday, where we're meeting up again with Mark Bielis and the other professionals to ask the question. Um, uh, and, and at the moment, we're on a learning curve, but your question is a very interesting one, and, uh, and, and I'll explore that as we move forward with our projects. Um, so I just, I really appreciated your, your honesty about often when we move from theory to practice, things don't go as systematically as we had hoped. Um, and especially when you think that you have this brilliant policy that seems to um, catch many of the um, potential problems, how do you incentivize some of those steps from the top to the actual access point? Do you have um, specific examples of whether you have incentives or ways in which you're hoping to um, have less of this sort of problem with implementation from the top down? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think for me, I'd love to get over to Norway because my understanding is that half the budget of programs, there's essentially if you have a, an approach to implementing a program, half the money goes on the program and half goes on reviewing the implementation and strengthening the implementation of the program. And frankly, that's, that's, that's not where we have been putting our commissioning and our money in Northern Ireland. Partly, you know, um, uh, I think that 
There's been a lot of money sloshing about Northern Ireland for quite a long time to support the peace process. It's certainly there's much less money, money now. So actually we are forced by having less to be more precise about how it is that we're making the right choices for the right programmes where they're fitting. Because the last thing you want is saying we've got dozens of programmes, this is great, but we know that the level of participation and take up of families is, is poor or problematic. Families aren't attending the programmes, and we all, it's very, very reassuring. Sometimes when you do presentations, say, here's, look, all, look at all these parenting programmes. But parenting programmes, we know sometimes we get the most mobile, most articulate, most intact families who attend the parenting programmes. Uh, is it the right case for the families who were saying, we've got the greatest concerns here for these families, and uh, they disengage or they don't turn up, uh, and so on. So we, we, we're having a very honest conversation about with providers and commissioners and using much more of an implementation science approach to work out whether in fact what we're purchasing and what we're delivering is, is effective and is really meeting the needs of families. Um, so, so those are some of the challenges, but you're right. It's also quite painful, if we're honest, because you're not going to be able to continue to do everything. You're only going to be able to, and you should, be critical about that and make decisions about what is the best you know, program and the best investment for those children, because that's ultimately what it's all about. Um, the other thing I'd say to you in terms of investment is if people buy into the goal, if they buy into the vision, that in of itself is a big, in, a big incentive. And that's what my hope for the Programme for Government is, that if people buy into a single outcome, it, ha it forces and encourages different kinds of conversations you know, between all those partners, including families themselves. You know? uh, so it's a gradual process, but it's, uh, it's not straightforward. Hi, thank you both very much. Um, I have a question about the transferability of the programming that you're doing. Because it sounds as though you have two constituencies that you're most trying to help. So people who are suffering from the um, after effects of, of the peace process. Mm -hmm. And then also people who are in situations of poverty. Yes. And I wonder if your programming is specific to each of those different communities and if because we have a lot of those communities, sort of different peace processes are going on around the world in different communities of poverty. So would it be transferable to those I think, communities elsewhere? Yeah, thanks. I think it would be. And here's, here's, the, here's the sad thing, that the people who were most affected by the conflict and lost most in terms of deaths and injuries were also the poorest people and in the poorest communities. And in North and West Belfast, where I worked uh, for a number of years, that was the highest concentration of death and injury throughout the conflict. I mean, like by a huge amount. Can't remember the percentage now. So these aren't different populations often. They're the same. They're not discreet, they're, you know, but uh, they are the same often. And so one of the things that is really very important is this issue of universal services. So we do need to improve our universal services. We need to take account of this evidence and it needs to impact on our mainstream services because that's where all the resources are. But if that's all we do, then we will miss those who have particular needs, those affected by trauma or indeed others who have vulnerabilities for whatever reason. So you, that's where the targeted intervention is required. And getting that balance right is not easy, but that is a fundamental part of our approach. Um, that it, it can't be all about universal services, it's got to be this duality. Um, and and, and it, you know, that's what we're working at. And it is definitely transferable. Yeah. Those principles are definitely transferable. I, I could believe last week because I came across um, a program, essentially a proposal in Scotland to ensure that the entire workforce who were engaging with families in early years had a, essentially a competency around trauma, working with the impact of trauma. I was thinking, how come in Northern Ireland we haven't done that? You know, and we haven't, you know, we, we've done some of it, but we haven't comprehensively said we're, we're a society where we're coming out of high scale trauma. Uh, effects on, on large numbers of families. So we've got to make sure we have a minimum level of competency and, and uh, for, for our staff in terms of the implication and co complexity of working with families with trauma. Because if you don't have that, then you're gonna just 
bang the programs in, bang the interventions, but actually the fundamental issues are that people are traumatized, you know? So there's learning there, and certainly we can share that, and I think that Scottish model we'll be having a look at to see. Uh, and so there are ways of maybe thinking about engaging with your circumstances as well. Oh, can I, just on the social enterprise, um, um, I meant to kind of just put a plug in. It was really based on the social enterprise conversation yesterday in the workshop. Please look up buildingchange.org, buildingchangetrust.org, uh, because it is a record and there's some really good videos of learning that myself and a number of our other board directors have about a 10-year journey spending 10 million pounds of money to try and really advance the whole progress on social finance, um, on uh, charitable funding, or, or cha cha charity banks, um, and uh, uh, evidencing impact. Uh, there's a lot of learning in that 10-year process and the investment we've made just in terms of people who might have an interest in that, that, that range of agenda as well. Hello. Thank you again for a wonderful presentation. I had, um, I had a question, but then in following up in this latest conversation, I had a, um, a comment or question. Does, does anybody know about the work of Enrique Chao in Colombia? It's called Aulas para la Paz, uh, Classrooms for Peace. So because of the war conflict yes. in Colombia, Colombia lasted so many years, uh, they have worked on this uh, project with, uh, he has worked with his graduate students for years in working with teachers to um, address, you know, this impact of trauma and violence in the children, starting from young, younger children, but also like inter intermediate years, because uh, there is a higher level of aggression and violence in, in schools. And uh, yeah, so I can pass that information. I also yeah, thought for the symposium, if, you know, if someone Separate. is interested. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah. Yeah. And I do know that Alan Smith, uh, the UNESCO chair in the University of Ulster, has actually been working with Columbia. So some of what we've learned in schools, uh, we're, we've learned and exchanged with Columbia. So um, in particular, um, education programs and the development of integrated education in the case of Northern Ireland, but the idea of citizenship as well as pro-social and, and less aggressive behavior. Yeah. yeah, perhaps there's some of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. great. And, 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 and I had a, oh, We have an organization called Early Years who also has been working directly with Columbia, so we can share that contact with you oh, if yeah. you want to follow that up. Yes, that would be great. Um, and the other one, or just I, I come from British Columbia and uh, I was admiring uh, this integration of services all through public health agency because something that I have seen, you know, working many years there is that um, there is a um, separation between Ministry of Child, Family and Ministry of Child, Family, how is it? MCFD, Ministry of Children and Family Development and Ministry of Health. So the programs are, are not mm -hmm. integrated. So how, how, do you have any tricks or recommendations on mm. how to bring this conversation, the continuous conversation back in BC? Yeah. We don't have a legislative framework to encourage that up until we've had the program for government. So for the last 20 years, what we've been doing is building individual partnerships and, and, and um, helping facilitate facilitate people to come together around common goals, so education, health, and so on. And there's a lot of practice in that field. Um, but that is still a voluntary commitment, and it's a partnership. So we, the only legislation we have is uh, around the Children and Young People's Strategic Partnership, but it's still not legislation to work together, essentially. It is still a partnership approach. So to move to the next level, is why that program for government is so important, because it's saying, you have got to, and not only do you need to, you senior civil servants are responsible for these 14 outcomes. So the top of our uh, civil service are actually accountable for the outcomes. And then they have identified senior people who are responsible for the indicators. And that is driving people to work across government in a way that we haven't been able to achieve at a strategic level. We've been doing it at the meso level, I would say, amongst partnership, as I say, but to actually get this really embedded, we'll take this new program for government. But I'm happy to share any of that. 
we, we had a private, but one of our uh, legislators in our assembly last year introduced a, a, co a cooperation bill, which was um, uh, is now ex moved into law. So there is essentially a statutory responsibility for agencies to work together to cooperate to support the well-being of the child. Now it's very untested, it's very early, and we can't necessarily see what the added value is and whether there's going to be some real new ways of working. But it's helpful, it might be something to consider uh, uh, as a further incentive to bring people together to say, it's not just a matter of, um, uh, of, of good favor, you turn it up, you have to turn up and to work out to create that well joined upness, which is critical. Okay, thanks very much indeed.